Okay, once again, if you want to download the presentation, go to streaminglearningcenter.com, which is my website. In the top left-hand corner, you'll see distributing your video, handouts for choosing a live encoder. Click that, and you'll be taken to an article that's got the, uh, the PDF file you can download. Okay, as usual, it's uh, 45 minutes, 45 slides, so let me get started. Um, we'll look at these categories in a minute um, in a little bit of a different graphic. I'm going to be covering, uh, actually, let's, let me just skip, skip over to, uh, to that when we get there, but the, uh, I guess that what I wanted to start off on the overview was a recognition that um, pretty much everybody at this point wants to get to the same place. You want to get to, and I, I take credit for this wonderful graphic, um, though I did steal some of the images from the internet. Um, you know, we want to get to multiple streams for the desktop and we want to get to multiple streams for mobile, right? So that's the, that's the logical completion point that we want to be able to deliver with our live event. Some more, some less, some three streams, some ten streams. But at the end of the day, most producers want diff you know, three sets of or two sets of streams, one for mobile, one for desktop. In a little while, this is going to be you know, Dash and maybe HLS. You know, it might be Flash, it might be Serverlight. But you need a stream or a set of streams for your desktop and a stream or a set of streams for your mobile. And you need both the content files and the metadata files. So this is what you need to end up with. And the point is, there's, there's multiple ways to get there. You know, one of the categories we'll be talking about is the big iron encoder. And um, this is the Elemental Live encoder. And it can do everything for you. You know, if you input an HDSDI signal, it can create all the streams and all the formats you want, all the metadata files, you know, and you're, and you're good to go. So that's one alternative. Another alternative is to go a completely different way. And you know you can use the Adobe Flash Live Media Encoder, which is a free encoder, create three streams, which is the maximum that that encoder supports, send those three streams to a server that can transmux them into the adaptive streams for the desktop and the adaptive streams for the mobile. Okay, so this is where we want to get to, and this is another alternative for getting there. Pretty much any streaming server today can transmux incoming streams and then customize them for both Flash and for uh, mobile. Obviously, IIS, the Microsoft solution, will customize these for smooth streaming, not for Flash, but you get to the same place. And yet another way to get to the same place, you know, a set of adaptive streams for the desktop and a set of adaptive streams for mobile, is to have an on-camera encoding tool. Send this to a live transcoding service or transrating service. So, and we'll talk about this category. You send one stream in to the cloud or to a server, and then that can create three files. And once you have these three files, you can send those to a Transmux server, create the adaptive streams for the desktop, and the adaptive streams for mobile. So I think it's important to realize that you know, where we want to get to, um, there's more than one way to get there. Okay? So there's, you don't need to buy a $36,000 encoder to produce the multiple streams. Now, there are some very good reasons to buy that encoder, but that's not the only alternative. You have multiple options. And it's, it's uh, two years ago, you couldn't say this. Two years ago, if you wanted to produce those multiple sets of streams, you needed the big iron encoders. Today, there's a lot more alternatives coming. You guys heard about uh, the iStream Planet alternative at the free lunch we all had. So they're talking about a live transcoding service that they're going to bring into play in, in 2013. So here's the wonderful diagram. Um, that, that talks about the different categories of live encoder that, you know, unless you're doing one thing and one thing only, and very few of us are doing that, you're, you're going to need at least one and probably more than one of, of these categories. And these are the categories we're going to work through. So there's hardware encoding, and there's four categories here. Software encoding, four categories here. And then I combine the cloud-based transcoding and the server-based transcoding into one because most of the, you know, Wowza offers a server-based transcode function, you know, one stream in, multiple streams out, but you can also put that in the cloud. Um, Coolabyte, which is a Vision subsidiary, same thing. You can buy it for your own server or you can put it in the cloud. So that category is kind of kind of scrunched into one, and that's how I'll cover it. But now, <clears throat> you know, with that as background, we'll jump into the into the different categories that you see here. So for each category, what I what I tried to identify is when you wanted to choose 
an option in that category, who the, who the main players in the category were, generic considerations, all the things you have to check anytime you buy an encoding tool. You know, does it output the streams you want and the format do you want? Does it accept your inputs? And then each category, or most categories, is also going to have an advanced consideration. And what I tried to do in the advanced considerations was these are the things you really need to think about to differentiate the final candidates. You know, once you work through the generic considerations, does it connect to my cameras? Does it output the required streams? Does it fit in my servers? Then you look to the advanced consideration and say, okay, this is how I differentiate the people who are left. Okay, so when do you buy a big iron system? And big iron system to me is, you know, systems like those shown on the right that cost, you know, anywhere between fifteen and, and, and forty thousand dollars. Now, from my perspective, um, you need to be distributing frequent large events to justify such an expenditure. You, you know, you guys know what your ROI requirements are, so you need to be able to have a return on investment for an investment of that size. Um, the other thing that this category does that you can't get in a lot of other categories are advanced features. So if you're a broadcaster, you know, you now have to support closed captioning for anything that's shown on TV. So not a lot of the encoding tools that are out there support that level of closed captioning. So you may need to buy a system like this just, just for the closed caption requirements that you have. If you're monetizing your video with advertising insertion, a lot of the cheaper encoders don't support this. You may need to spend more money on a big iron encoder. Same thing about access to encryption and digital rights management and audio normalization and, and COMAC stuff as well. I also think this category is the most reliable. You know, these are the these tools were used and are used today in broadcast operations that run 24-7. They're not Windows boxes that, you know, that people have kind of configured for this operation. They're they're industrial strength boxes. They're running Linux. They're, they're, this is what you'd want to do if, it, you know, if, if it's absolutely mission critical that the video goes through. So this is when I would consider that class. And here are, you know, I tried to get as many vendors as I could in here. Um, in, I guess I anticipate that you guys would take this back. If you look in this category, you just refer to this page and say, OK, well, let me check out the, you know, the, the products on this page. Um, generic considerations, this is, you know, we're going to see a lot of these same ones for each category. You know, the question number one is, does it connect to your inputs? And that's always, you know, you always need something that works in your existing systems. Most of the boxes that you're going to see have different, you know, they've got one that does SDI, they've got one that does component, they've got one that does IPN. So you're probably, most of the models that we see here are going to connect to whatever system you have, but you need to, to make sure that the pricing that you, that, you, uh, that you get in your bids is for the, the inputs you'll be using, because pricing varies significantly based upon the input. And then does it produce the required outputs? And this is, this is complicated, right? Because as we talked about, and I'm going to go back to one of the initial slides, you need to know what this schema is going to look like for your production before you can buy an encoding tool. Right? Because it could look like this, in which case you need an encoding tool that supplies all this stuff. Or it could look like this, where you send one file through transrating services to Transmux for the, for, the, for the different formats you need to support. So you really need to, you know, before you, before you start looking in this category, you need to say, okay, what do we need this thing to output? How does it fit into our overall distribution schema? If you've got a WOWS a media server, you don't need the metadata files. You don't need the chunked content files. Wows, it can do that for you. So I'm not saying you need to use that alternative. I'm just saying you need to know how that schema is going to work before you buy in this category. Um, most of the products, I mean, if you look through the, the spec sheets, you'll see that most products have remote operation and, and monitoring via browser-based interfaces. In most of them, you can create and modify presets, and then you can schedule broadcast for automated operation. And I'm gonna, you're going to see this in pretty much every slide in the generic considerations. Nobody says our product's cheap, but the quality sucks. Um, I mean, everybody says our product is market leading. Everybody says our scaling and deinterlacing is better than everybody else's. Um, and it's just really hard to verify. I mean, I've tested my share of products. Th these products are very challenging to, to test. Um, takes a long time. You know, and by the time you get to number six, number one has revised their software. So it's, nobody's done comprehensive testing on this. And from, 
I just tend to say, okay, the quality is roughly equal. Most of the pro you know most of the vendors in this category have very glittery uh, vendors using their products, right? You know, they've got the Olympics, they've got you know Major League Baseball. So I just assume that quality and scaling are going to be the equivalent, and, and I just kind of throw that out of the consideration. So when I, you know, if, if I'm starting to narrow down in this category, the first question I ask is, what's the density? I mean, how many of these units do I need to buy to produce the streams that I require? And this is where, you know, this is, this is where systems, you know, in particular Elemental, um, they do a nice job with the GPU and CPU encoding, and they tend to produce units that output a lot of, a lot of streams. So you may need to buy two or three Elemental live encoders compared to four or five from somebody else. Um, and that's obviously, you know, a, a consideration for purchase price. It's a consideration for operating costs and all that. Advertising support, you're going to see some variance in the advertising support in each of these units. Same thing with closed caption support. Uh, closed captioning is if you're a broadcaster and you've got TV output, this is going to get very, this has gotten very complicated very fast. And you need to make sure that not only, you know, all of these units were production in the television environment so they can all pass through closed captions to OTT over the top devices, but what do they do for Flash? What do they do for HLS? What do they do for smooth streaming if that's a target of yours? And then one of the, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in H.265 in the next 12 to 18 months, but if you're going to be spending you know, thirty to forty thousand dollars on a piece of hardware. You need to know, or at least ask the question: What happens when H.265 comes out? Will this be software upgradable? Some systems are yes, some systems are, are no, some systems are I don't know. But if you know, I think we're all going to be, you know, H.265 is going to is going to come in in different tiers. You know, it's going to be probably cable and satellite first, and then it's going to be some devices, and then it's going to be general maybe in, in five to ten years, but it's going to be something that we're all going to need to think about. Um, audio normalization. Audio normalization in Comac, this is probably, I'm sure all the encoding tools can do this. This is something that differentiates this category from, um, from some of the other lower cost categories. You know, does it support the encryption and digital rights management you'll be using? Um, can you output the streams to multiple redundant servers? These are all questions you need to ask yourself. Um, and then OS. I mean, I think most of these are most of these systems are running Linux. Um, you know, I use Windows. I'm not a Mac bigot in any way, but I, I would hate to put my life on Windows reliability. You know, I mean, it, I would probably prefer Linux in a in a in industrial strength category more than I would Windows. So that's definitely a question that I would ask. And then price is going to vary significantly based upon the inputs that you use and also, you know, the, the number of HD streams that you're going to be producing. Okay, so that's the big iron. Next category is portable. Uh, when do you want to use a portable system when you're broadcasting from multiple locations? You know, if, if we were broadcasting from here and next week these same production people were broadcasting from another hotel room or hotel ballroom, you know, they'd want a portable system. You also want a portable system when you want to take the computer out of the equation. I'm not a big fan of using computers in live broadcasting. I think computers crash. I think they get viruses. I think people download stuff on them. So I prefer an appliance um, for, for the broadcast that I do. Who are the players? You know, Digital Rapids is big with the touch stream unit. That's this guy up here. Um, hey Vision and their Viper unit, another touch stream, another touch screen system here. Viewcast has several products, the uh, 2200 and the 4100. That's this guy here. And then this is kind of a new one from OptiBase. This is a, uh, it's, um, all these three are computers. You can put a, put a keyboard and put a monitor in them or, or you know, they run via touch screen. This is not a computer, but, um, you know, it's basically just an encoder. But, you know, it doesn't have a fan, so you could, you can literally have it up here and it could be encoding. So if you're in a conference room, you don't have room to space out. All these other units are loud. Can't really put them near the camera, can't really put them near the speaker. Um, generic considerations, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this page. These ones over here are the ones that I've covered. You know, they're same for each. You know, does it produce the streams you need? Does it connect your inputs? I'm not going to go over this again. Um, in this category, most of the products have one button streaming. That's important if you want to configure the unit in your office, send it out with non-technical people. 
All they have to do is you know, turn the camera on, plug the camera in, get the audio working, and press the stream button. And, and that's nice if you're working with non-technical users. Also nice, but available in all these products is remote operation and monitoring. So if you're back in your office, you can log into the system remotely and make changes if, if that's necessary. <clears throat> you can create and modify encoding presets in all these tools, and you can choose the preset in the office and then use that in the field. Um, <clears throat> if I was choosing between units in this category, you know, the big question for me is touch screen or not. Um, if you don't have a touch screen, you have to control the unit either with a separate monitor and keyboard, or you can log into it um, on another computer on the same network. The, uh, I really like the touch screen paradigm. It's very convenient, but it also costs a lot of money. You know, that's probably another two to three thousand dollars in price. You know, it, if, if that's in your budget, I think that's that's a good expenditure. The um, graphics input, if you're running, you know, if, if we were streaming this event and we wanted to have both the, the slides and the video running, um, this unit here from Hayvision can take um, computer input in as well as the live video feed and then present them in side-by-side -side windows. So I think that's the only one that can do that. But if you want to, you know, if you want to broadcast events that have screen input and video input, then make sure you've got graphics input on the uh, on the unit that you buy. Size and weight will differ will differ dramatically. Pricing will differ. Uh, pricing will also dip, vary dramatically based upon connections here. Digital rapids can get quite pricey for, you know, HD, SDIN, and HD output. Big difference in this category is noise. Um, again, this unit is perfectly quiet. There's no fan can work anywhere. Um, all of these other units are, are too loud to really have close to your speaker or close to, um, or, or um, you know, anywhere in the room where people are trying to listen to it. <coughs> and again, operating system, you know, you've heard my, my, my mini rant on Windows versus Linux. Okay, this is kind of a fun category. Um, that's these guys here, the, um, the on-camera encoders. When do you use a portable encoder that's on camera as, as compared to the category we just looked at? You know, if you need battery operation, uh, none of these guys operate on a battery, um, but all of these guys operate on a battery. Um, if you don't have Ethernet or Wi-Fi, you need an encoding tool that can, that can um, push out a signal via 4G. And then if you have to move the camera around, you know, if you're following somebody walking around outside, you're following some kind of award ceremony, um, it's nice to have these on camera, like this unit here, and all, and all the rest of them can do that. Um, who's in this category? You've got live gear with the air cam. That's these guys here. You've got live stream broadcaster. That's this red demon right here. You've got minicaster that's not shown. That's a European country uh, company. And then you've got Teradec, and we're showing the bond and the cube here. So this is a combination of both an encoding tool and a 4G aggregation tool, right? So you've got the encoder on the bottom. That's converting the stream from the camera into H.264. And then you've got this kind of funky looking thing here that's got four 4G modems connected to it. And that's sending the signal out via 4G. So this has the integrated 4G. This is a unit that you would attach a 4G via serial port. And this has 4G aggregation. And we'll talk about the significance of that in a moment. Generic considerations, all these are the same. Does it connect your inputs? Does it produce required outputs? Um, most of the products in this category can mount on the camera. And most have USB connections for 4G. OK, so you can kind of assume those are standard features for all the products in the category. The, um, Big questions, you know, which one do I buy of the ones that kind of meet my basic needs? Um, if I'm connecting to live stream, I've got a real bias to want to use a live stream product. They're going to support it better. It's going to work easier. You know, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be an easier um, an easier fit for me. On the other hand, probably the biggest question, probably the biggest question you have to ask is, is, is it Wi-Fi or is it 4G? Because the broadcaster, the broadcaster is... Um, it can do either Wi-Fi or 4G, but it's only got a single USB connection for a 4G modem. Um, all the rest of these have multiple 4G links, so they're 4G aggregators. So what does 4G aggregation buy you? What do these four modems buy you? It buys you three things. Number one, 
um, you can have modems from different vendors. So if you've got, you know, if AT&T is doing well and Verizon is sucky that day, you can still get your signal through one of those two or one of those three. You also get aggregation. So, you know, if you've got four Verizon modems because you know it's working well, you can aggregate the signal and get a four, or 500, uh, four to five megabit per second stream out, which can be really, really good starting quality for a, a group of adaptive streams. So if I was doing, you know, the live stream broadcaster can have a single 4G modem, but that's not really an industrial strength solution for me. One modem, you know, just doesn't do it. You really, if you're going to be serious about 4G, you need link aggregation. Um, the other, it, and, and if you're serious about 4G, I would recommend buying an encoding tool and a, and a link aggregation tool from the same vendor. And the reason for doing that is once they, they can talk to each other because they're, they're from the same vendor, if the effective throughput drops, they can drop the throughput down. So if your modem's working and you're at four megabits per second and then the throughput drops, the modem aggregator can tell the encoder, look, drop the encoding quality. You know, we don't have the bandwidth to push the stream out anymore. So live stream using a single USB 4G modem can't do that. But if you have a, uh, a link aggregation tool and an encoder from the same vendor, you can do that. So if you're serious about 4G, um, I would look for a solution that's both encoding and link aggregation. Other factors to consider, um, battery life is, is a huge difference between these units. The live stream unit was very, you know, very, very sketchy in terms of battery life. It ranged from like 30 minutes in some configurations to, to, uh, to an hour. And then this unit here, the, uh, the Teradec unit, was about three hours with an onboard battery. So that's, you know, if you're going out to shoot for an hour, it's nice to have that kind of headroom, um, you know, so you know you're not going to run out of power. Other features, features to look for is onboard um, SD card storage. You know, if you want to shoot, encode, get the file from the encoding, you know, from the encoder, pull it out, and then put it into a computer, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice convenience feature. Not every product has that. I prefer integrated batteries that are chargeable versus insertable batteries. Um, obviously, integrated, you know, if you're going to be shooting five-hour deals, um, but the battery that's integrated is three hours, then that's not a good solution for you. The other thing that you're going to see some differences is the remote control applications. Um, Livestream did a really nice job building an iPhone control, so you can you can run their encoding tool through their system. You can create a job, create a create an event, choose your encoding parameters all from your iPhone, and that's very convenient. Be computer to a, to a, to a, a shoot if you don't have to. And Teradec also did a very nice job with an with an iPad and uh, and an iPhone um, uh, control. So if you're going to be serious about this, uh, this is a real this is a real important um, factor to consider. Okay, so going, moving into our, uh, our specialized hardware, um, if you really need industrial strength kind of um, remote broadcasting, this is the Live Gear Airstream. It's integrated encoding with multiple mode bonded 3G and 4G. So this takes advantage of you know, integrated encoding. It can, it can change the bit stream if throughput drops. Um, you can't see it very well in this picture, but this is video preview. You know, pre video preview is always nice to have. You know, it, it, it's, it's lovely to see a stream there as opposed to a button that reads red and says, yes, that means you're streaming. Um, the other thing this unit gives you is up to six-hour operation with hot swappable batteries. So, you know, if you've got a real industrial strength off-site event where you've got no power, um, this is a unit that I would consider uh, real strongly. And this is um, this is a unit that that launched at the show, and it's a pretty cool unit. So what you have here is you've got a webcam that uses Wi-Fi to send the streaming signal directly to UStream. So basically, you've got no computer necessary. You've got you know you just put the uh, put the webcam on a desk somewhere and you don't even turn on your computer. So very convenient if you're a Ustream uh, subscriber. It can also operate as a traditional webcam, you know, connecting to your computer via Wi-Fi. 
So this is a product that um, I hope to test in the next few weeks. So that's our hardware. Um, and now let's move to software. And we've got four categories here, enterprise, desktop, production, and coding, and then service provider specific. Then we'll get into the cloud and the, uh, and the server-based transcoding. So this is, um, this is a category of one. There's one software program out there. It's from Hayvision. It's the Cool Byte Encoder. Um, it costs, should have asked, I think it costs around $6,000. Um, very high quality. It can produce adaptive output, you know, both the metadata files and the content files. It does advertising insertion and closed caption support. As far as I know, it's the only software solution that does all that. Um, although Telstream, I think, just announced they announced some closed captioning and support in Wirecast, but that, that just came out. I haven't had a chance to look at that. So if you prefer a software solution to a hardware solution, um, you don't want to buy a $40,000 box. You'd rather buy $6,000 software, put it in an, an existing computer. Um, the only alternative I think you really have is the Hayvision Coolabyte software. And that's, that's offered in a number of different configurations. You can buy it as software only, install it yourself. You can put it in a... Um, put it in a portable unit. That's the unit we saw in the portable category, or you can, you can buy it in rack-mounted hardware. And you can also use it in the cloud. So kind of a, if you're interested in the software side or the cloud side, Hayvision needs to be someone you consider because I think they play in all those separate categories. Uh, their product has been around for a while, and it is, it is a very strong encoder with good features. Again, generically, you need to worry about does it produce the required outputs? And Coolabyte, like everybody else says, it's the best quality, superior scaling, and, and um, you know, again, I would consider all that stuff generic. But this is the only product in this category, so if you, if you really want to build your own industrial strength solution, I think it's tough to do around some of the other cheaper encoders like the Adobe Flash Media Encoder. You know, that's not a, a tool I'd build in, in industrial strength um, encoding farm around, particularly because it doesn't support uh, captioning and, and uh, other necessities. Okay, so that gets us into the desktop encoders categories. And this is basically, you know, if you've, you're just starting out, you want to, uh, you want to create a live event, you don't want to spend a lot of money. There's basically two alternatives in this category. You've got the Adobe Flash Media Live Encoder um, that's free. Uh, runs on both Mac and Windows, and then you've got Microsoft Expression Encoder. Really, it comes down to this. I mean, if you're producing a Flash event, you've got to do the Adobe Flash Media Live Encoder. If you're producing a Silverlight event, you've got to use the Microsoft Expression Encoder. So those are your only, you know, those are the two options in, in that kind of class. Working with software, you know, big issue is compatibility with video input cards. So we all use cards from Blackmagic or from Asia or from Matrox, companies like that. There's a big variance in the level of support of these software programs for cards from the different vendors. So the first question you need to ask when you're considering using a software product is, does it work with the hardware that I plan to buy? And then it's, does it reproduce the, uh, produce the required outputs? As I said, you know, Flash supports Flash. Expression Encoder supports uh, Smooth and Silverlight. One in limitation of the Adobe Flash Live Media Encoder is that it maxes out at three streams. So if you want to produce four streams or five streams, um, you'll either need two computers or you'll need a Transmux solution. Here's the generic claims everybody makes. And really, in this category, it just comes down to if you want Flash, choose the Adobe Flash Media Live Encoder. If you want Smooth Silverlight, choose Expression Encoder. And then production encoders, this category, um, this is the, the, uh, the Wirecast and Vidcaster category. You know, you don't want to spring $5,000 to $15,000 for a TriCaster, but you want to switch multiple cameras. You want to insert transitions between your switches. You want titles. You want to play on-demand files, picture-in-picture um, -picture type capabilities. This is the products that you can, you can get that with. This is Telstream Wirecast. It starts at $499, available on Mac and Windows. Um, and this is VidBlaster from CombiTech. starts at $195, but ends up in the in the $1,200 price range for, for a, a pretty functional product. You know, big question in this category is does it support your OS? A lot of video producers like working on the Mac. Um, CombiTech does not operate on the Mac. Wirecast does. Um, the whole 
video input card question that's, that's very relevant in this category. Telstream has done a really good job getting a lot of application vendor support on the hardware side. It's a little bit tougher for, um, for Combitech because they're, they're a German company or they're a European company and it's a smaller company. So I think hardware support is going to be in Wirecast's favor. Um, I think Wirecast has done a nice job creating features that are very friendly to streaming producers such as ourselves. So they can encode to multiple formats simultaneously. If you need to support both Windows Media and um, Flash, they can do that. They can stream to multiple servers simultaneously. They can store a stream to disk. And they've got a lot of presets for streaming service providers of your choice, right? So if you use Livestream or Ustream, it's probably going to be a one-button connect. Download an XML file, and, and, and it'll work pretty easily. Um, So that's the production category. Streaming service provider specific. Um, I use both Livestream and Ustream. I probably use Livestream a little bit more. Um, whenever I use Livestream, I use the software that Livestream provides. Why? Because I know it's going to connect well. I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to work well within their system. It's free, um, and it's just easy. So if you're, gonna, if you're working with a live streaming service provider like Ustream or Livestream, the first question to ask is, do they have an encoding tool? And in particular, Livestream and Ustream do. Livestream's got the free Procaster as well as either, I think they're free, but they could be you know, $10 applications for iPhone and Android. And then Ustream's got a free version of Producer plus iPhone and Android encoders tool, uh, as well. Livestream Studio, they've introduced their first. It's kind of a TriCaster uh, competitor. I think it's $8,500. Um, going to be a very interesting product. It's got, you know, it's TriCaster-like, so it's got, you know, live switching, multiple cameras, titling, green screen, all that stuff. I think they're going to migrate that into software only um, over the next six to 12 months. So I think, you know, they're going to try and expand their product offering to be very complete. What Ustream did was they licensed Wirecast from Telstream. So they've got a free version, and then they've got versions that have camera switching and a lot of those features that, uh, that you pay, I think, up to $500 for. Bottom line is if you're working with a service provider like Ustream or Livestream, check their software first and see if it can, see if it can work for you. OK, and then the, the last category we're going to cover um, is the server cloud transcoding. Again, this covers both server and cloud-based stuff. And this is a cool picture from the Wowza transcoder. Basically, you have a single, single stream coming in. It goes into the cloud or into the server, and then it, in real time, transcodes that into multiple iterations. So technically, this is a, I guess, a transrate, usually, because it's taking H.264 in and then transrating it to different, um, to different size and, and data rate streams. But, but transcode is, is equally, you know, most people are going to call it that. High level point is one stream in, multiple streams out, and they're, they're re-encoding to multiple streams. So when do you want to use this? You want to use it, you know, you guys heard the pitch at lunch today. You know, if you have a periodic large event like the Super Bowl, um, you don't want to spend $40,000 on an encoding tool that you're going to use once a year. If you want to just spin up some cloud transcoders, it makes a lot of sense, you know, if you're, if you're, you're broadcasting as episodic. Um, you know, the other thing that where cloud transcoding makes a lot of sense is in facilities like this where you're working with limited bandwidth out, um, if you wanted to create, you know, the six streams we talked about, you might need seven or eight megabits of bandwidth per second to get it out the door, to get it from here out to the streaming server. Most facilities don't have that. So what these live transcoders give you the ability to do is to send one three or four megabit stream out, very high quality, and then they can transcode that. So you don't have to spend the money for the encoding on site, and you don't need the outbound bandwidth on site. I think those are two very powerful reasons within the live environment to use this service. And then it, the, the transcoding does increase the latency a bit. Um, spoke to the gentleman from Hayvision. He said it was no more than two to three seconds. I think either you care about you know, a half a second or one second latency, or 30 seconds is fine. But you know, two or three seconds I don't think is killer either way. Either it's close enough or it doesn't matter. 
So I, I don't think two to three seconds is, is, is going to be a big deal. Who are the players? Um, hey Vision Cool by Transcoder. That product has been shipping for a while um, in many iterations. Um, uh, Wowza has been shipping for a while as well. Brightcove owns Zencoder. Zencoder just launched a transcoding software as a service. That's cloud only. You can't put it on your own servers. This is in beta right now, so it's not, not currently shipping. Um, same generic considerations. Does it input the streams you're currently outputting? Does it produce the required outputs? And then they're all going to claim the best quality, the lowest latency, and um, you know, the claims are just going to be tough to verify. Questions I ask if I'm considering this alternative is, is pricing. You know, do I need to spend $6,000 for a server, or if I do an event a month, can I just buy it for a day? I think Wowza has done a really interesting job presenting their pricing on a daily or a monthly or a, you can buy it if you need it, you can rent it for a day, you can rent it for a week. So, um, and then I, you know, I, this is the kind of product that sounds real easy. I mean, this looks, this looks really easy, right? Send a single stream in and send three streams out. But I think the nuts and bolts, you know, the devil's going to be in the details. You, need to make, you just need to make sure that you check all the boxes to make sure it's, it's going to work in your, in, in your environment. I think you're going to see a big variance in closed captioning. Um, so all the things you need for broadcast distribution today, closed captioning, DRM, advertising insertion, I don't think all these products are going to support them at the same level, so I would ask a lot of questions there. And then, you know, all the, the, this, this whole category is new, so I would, I would place a pretty big, um, pretty big reliance on proven performance, who's using it, who are their customers, um, how has it worked for them, the support levels, um, you know, are they going to be there when you call them, or, or is, it, is it a high-volume service where they just, they're just trying to get um, minutes through? And then you're probably going to need some integration services. Is this something the company can do for you, or are they just a, you know, a real high-volume OVP-like structure that's not going to have that available? Okay, so that's, um, that's the presentation. We've got time for, well, let me just make the announcement again. Um, anybody came in late, you can download the handout on my website. It's uh, streaminglearningcenter.com. And if you click distributing your video, you'll see the presentation I just gave available as a download here uh, on that page. So streaminglearningcenter.com, and the handout is the top handout. Any questions? So, so the question is, who's the most reliable um, cloud encoder? I mean, at this point, I talked to Wows and I talked to Hayvision, and I, uh, they're both very, very proven in this market. Zencoder, I think, is a great company. They're, as I said, they're owned by Brightco, but their product is in beta, so they're not, um, they're not going to have a lot of success stories right now. Give them a month or two. I mean, they, they probably will. Do we, do we have a microphone for these people, or? Regarding uh, Coolabyte in the cloud, do you know if there's an AMI available at Amazon or how that, how that works exactly? I don't. Good question. Um, but they are here, so you can, you, can, uh, you can just ask them. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about reliability of, of the new portable units? Okay, so talk about reliability of which, uh, port which portable. What's your CEO's temper like? Um, can, can he take a joke? I mean, I, you know, I think the Vitech unit, um, I just finished looking at that. That review will be up on a stream media site sometime in the next mm, couple of weeks. But, uh, you know, the, I think you have to look at the company. And Vitech, that was built for military use. 
So you know, it, it's uh, you know, it, it, it's used 24/7 in a lot of different applications, and I would feel pretty good about that. But Digital Rapids is a very reputable. Um, Viewcast is very reputable, and then you know, Hayvision. It, you know, again, that's a very so. I think all the companies are, are very, very proven in the field. They're not, they're not fly by night. Um, there are new companies in some other areas, like the whole cellular bonding thing. There's there's new companies in there, and I'm not saying they're not reliable, but um, that's an area where you've got new entrants where you can't really look at the company history and say, well, gosh, they've delivered before; they'll deliver now. So, but I think all the vendors that, Vitech in particular, because it's it's a military, you know, the product was developed for military type applications. I think it's very robust. There's no moving parts, so there's less to break. Um, you know, so that's that. I think if, if that's your major concern, I think that's yeah. I would have at least a look at that product. Okay. Any other questions? So where specifically do you put the the, the TriCaster? Yeah, good. So where do I put the TriCaster? That's a great because I was thinking just as I was done, it's like, oops, I forgot about the TriCaster. Um, the TriCaster until very recently used to have to have a separate, um, I think it had to have a, a separate encoder. But I think now they have an integrated encoder. And, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, I'm, I, I haven't looked at it, so I, um, but I'm sure it's fine. They're, they're a reputable company as well. You know, again, same questions. Can it produce the streams? Does, you know, where does it fit in your, in your, your whole workflow? Just a point, I mean, TriCaster's always had an encoder, but most people probably use the TriCaster as a switcher, and then they'll feed that out to one Okay, I think I think when I used the TriCaster, it, it didn't have that capability. I think I. Yeah, I always recorded a disc and then, but I, I'm sure you're right. But I, didn't they just announce something new though? Didn't they just talk about? Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Tough session right after lunch. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>